extremely passionate about nutrition. John Clinthorne earned his Ph.D. in human nutrition from Michigan State University. And by the way, congratulations, you beat Michigan in a weird play. Did anybody see that game? I happen to be from Michigan. Yeah. Flint, Michigan. In case you don't know where Flint is, let me just, everybody from Michigan does this. Okay, there's the mitten, right? So Detroit's here, uh, Ann Arbor's here, and Flint is right about here. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it's a great place to be from. Anyway, diet involving, and the immune function as well. Um, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Clint Thorne. He has been involved in a variety of research topics, including aging, probiotics, calorie intake. You talked about the immune system immune function, and omega-3 fatty acids. Dr. Clinthorne's current focus is using his understanding of nutritional science to dispel nutritional myths and help us take responsibility for our own well-being by educating us, and that's what he's going to do today, about the numerous ways that diet supports health, and they, uh, you need not be afraid about food. I'm personalizing this here. When not working as a nutritional education specialist at Natural Grocers, you can find Dr. Clinthorne running, hiking, skiing, all the things that uh, I can't do and, frankly, don't want to. Anyway, uh, he, <laughs> he is found always in the mountains of Colorado. One of these health nuts. Let's talk. Let's just be honest. Dr. Clinthorne, though, will be sharing with us about the role nutrition plays in brain health. Dr. Clinthorne. Come on up. Where are you, sir? Thank you. <laughs> so first, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. This is a really exciting opportunity to get to talk about something that I am very passionate about, which is the gut microbiota. And when Wayne invited me to come speak here, I thought, hmm, what can I talk about that's going to be new, cutting-edge science that I will get to share with all of you? And not only is the microbiota a aspect of cutting edge science, it's also invisible, so it's perfect. Um, and before we can really get into talking about the gut microbiota and the gut brain axis, we have to understand what the gut brain axis is. So I know I'm here to talk about brain health, but I'm actually going to talk about your second brain. And this is the brain that resides in your gut. This is called your enteric nervous system. 500 million neurons. Uh, the enteric nervous system is able to autonomously regulate itself. It signals to the uh, central nervous system via afferent nerve fibers in the vagus nerve uh, and is able to autonomously regulate its own blood flow, mucosal secretions. Uh, and maybe one of the best ways of describing the communication that can go on between the uh, digestive system and the central nervous system is by highlighting irritable bowel syndrome. And people who suffer from irritable bowel syndrome develop hypersensitivity to normal gas, normal bloating, uh, but they're hypersensitive to it. And these signals of hypersensitivity are then relayed to their central nervous system and can impact their behavior as well as the way that they uh, feel and function in daily life. People with irritable bowel syndrome are much more likely to develop depression. They have increased sensation of pain. Uh, it's just one of the ways that the enteric nervous system interacts with the central nervous system. But really, understanding the enteric nervous system is only half of the story. And thanks to advances in research in the last decade, and this has to do with the ability to rapidly sequence genomes of our, of our gut microbiota, and these are the bacteria that live in our gut. You have trillions of bugs that are housed in your gut. And thanks to the advances in technology in the last decade, we have seen an explosion, a literal explosion of research involving the gut microbiota. And this was published in Nature Biotechnology in uh, 2013. And in 2002, we had about 265 peer-reviewed papers published about the gut microbiota. By 2012, 2,683 papers. In 10 years, a tenfold increase in the number of papers published in peer-reviewed journals about the gut microbiota. I wouldn't be surprised if in 2015 we're approaching 5,000 papers published about the gut microbiota and how it influences different aspects of health. So what are we starting to learn about this gut microbiota, about these bacteria that live on our skin and that bacteria that reside in our gastrointestinal tract? Well, at a cellular level, you, me, all of us, we are more bacterial than we are human. Think about that for a second. Have you ever considered that? You are only 10% human at a cellular level. We are outnumbered 10 to 1 
by the number of bacteria that live in our digestive tract. It's kind of a scary thought. Um, not only are you outnumbered by the, by the bacteria in your digestive tract, but they're able to influence numerous aspects of health. And the stomach houses some of them, the small intestine more, but the vast majority of these bacteria, 100 trillion bacteria, live in your large intestine, in your colon. Not only are we outnumbered, but metagenomic studies, looking at the total genomic material, the total genetic material of these bacteria, have really started to shed some light on the genetic potential of our bacteria. We are actually outnumbered 100 to 1 when we look at the total genetic material of the gut microbiota compared to the genetic material in the human genome. And these genes can be turned on or can be turned off uh, depending on what you're eating on various inputs. Uh, antibiotics can turn on and turn off these genes. Pesticides, heavy metals, prebiotics. So if you're consuming uh, fermentable starches, these genes can be turned on, can be turned off. And the uh, availability of genes is, is totally un misunderstood right now. It's totally underestimated what the genetic potential of all these genes are and how these genes could be actually influencing our health and whether or not we're able to turn them on or turn them off. And this idea that we are vastly outnumbered by the number of bacteria on our bodies, the number of bacteria living in our gastrointestinal tract, uh, and the genetic material that these bacteria possess have kind of changed the idea of what the human organism is. Humans are now maybe thought of as a meta-organism or a super-organism. And this is an organism that is not just taking into account the way that human cells are working, but also taking into account the symbiotic relationship we have to have with our bacteria that are residing on us. And I have good news for you guys. You never eat alone. You'll never be eating alone again, right? You have commensal bacteria, which is what the gut microbiota is often referred to as, uh, that are going to be eating everything that you're eating. And that's something to think about before you go to lunch. Everything you're going to eat is going to be seen by those gut bugs that uh, as it makes its way down there. And commensal actually comes from the Latin, commensa, which is table and sal, together. Um, and this is to eat together. So this is your opportunity to eat together. Um, and you just are always uh, having this company with you while you're eating food. And so we are programmed from birth to be colonized by bacteria. The fetus is sterile, largely sterile as far as we can tell. Um, before birth, before the mother gives birth, the bacteria in her vaginal canal begin to change in pre preparation for colonizing the baby with specific microbes. Um, once the baby's born, those microbes are inhaled by it. Uh, it's covered in those microbes. Breast milk contains galacto-oligosaccharides, a specific prebiotic that can be used in order to promote the growth of certain microbes in the baby's digestive tract. Uh, my point is, we have evolved, we have this evolutionary need, uh, this evolutionary niche for these bacteria to grow on us, to grow in us. Uh, and I think we're largely underestimating the role that these bacteria do. And, and we allow them to ride around in our digestive tract. We provide them with food sources. Um, you know, there's between three and five pounds of bacteria residing in everyone's gut right now. Um, try not to grimace. I know that's kind of gross, but it, it's, it's interesting to think that that's about the same weight as the human brain. Uh, but what do, yeah, right, thanks. Uh, but what do they do for us in return? What are these bacteria doing for us? Uh, what kind of, if I said this is a symbiotic relationship, we've largely viewed this as a parasitic relationship. We think of bacteria as bad. We don't want bacteria. Um, but what are they doing for us in return? And this is where the research gets really exciting and starting to understand what these bacteria that uh, are residing in and on us are doing for us. And thanks to advances in all these technologies that I've been talking about, we're much better able to understand the symbiotic relationship we have with these gut bacteria. So we know that the gut microbiota actually synthesize vitamins in infants. In the first couple years of life, almost all their B vitamins are obtained from their gut bacteria, as is vitamin K. Um, they educate our immune system. So babies are born without almost any, their, their immune system is totally naive. It doesn't, hasn't seen any pathogens, any microbes before. So they help educate the immune system. There's this huge interplay between your immune system and, and your back, gut bacteria as you're developing. They nourish epithelial cells. They produce short-chain fatty acids when they digest 
prebiotic starches that are found in fruits and vegetables. And these uh, short-chain fatty acids actually serve as an energy source for the gut epithelial cells. And importantly, they interact with our central nervous system. And I'm going to introduce this concept of what I like to call microbial mind control. And that might sound kind of uh, strange to you, maybe kind of foreign, but the idea of microbial mind control shouldn't be that foreign to people. We all are familiar with rabies. Rabies is a viral infection where you're actually more predisposed to aggressive behavior because of this microbial mind control. Uh, you also develop hydrophobia. You're scared of water when you have rabies. Um, other organisms, such as Toxoplasma uh, gondii, which is a, a common uh, bacteria found in, in cat poop, cat feces, uh, actually can infect rodents. And when it infects rodents, rodents become sexually attracted to cats. This is microbial mind control, sexually attracted to cats, so that the cats can eat them, and this organism can renew its life cycle. Now, these are more of a parasitic type of relationship, but it just highlights the ability of microbes to actually manipulate behaviors. And so using germ-free mice, and these are mice that are kept in sterile uh, isolator bubbles, totally plastic bubbles. It's like Bubble Boy, but for a mouse. Um, we're able to actually study what the presence or complete absence of this gut microbiota has on health. So what's been observed in germ-free mice is that they have all sorts of abnormal brain behavior, brain activity. Um, they actually have decreased levels of uh, one of the growth hormones in the brain that we were talking about earlier, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, they have increased levels of stress hormone, cortisol. They also have a lot more propensity to develop anxiety-like behaviors. Um, and what's really interesting is that you can actually ameliorate these behaviors, these anxiety-like behaviors, by taking these germ-free mice and colonizing them with uh, the microbiota from a conventionally housed mouse, a mouse that's not kept in a sterile isolator bubble. Now, there's been some research looking at how a probiotic that could, could colonize a germ-free mouse and manipulate behavior, and it was found that Bifidobacterium infantis, uh, a common probiotic, is actually able to reduce these anxiety-like behaviors. So the researchers who did this study were starting to wonder, well, is it just general sensing of microbes that's requ required in the gut, or is it specific microbes having specific effects on behaviors? And what they found is that if they monocolonized these germ-free mice with Bifidobacterium infantis, they had a reduction in anti-anxiety or in anxiety-like behaviors. If they monocolonized these germ-free mice with E. coli, they didn't see any reduction in those anxiety-like behaviors. So now we're seeing that this is very specific to specific organisms. Not only that, but if they were to sever the vagus nerve, this line of communication between the gut and the brain, they lost all the positive effects of that probiotic uh, supplementation. Now, a lot of this research has been done in animals. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to study the microbiota in humans to develop uh, causative relationships. However, there's some really interesting research that's being done in the last couple years looking at how probiotics can actually modulate brain activity. So this was a study where for 28 days they had their study participants consuming a fermented probiotic milk. So this is just a, a fermented milk product, probably like a kefir. Um, and what they found was that they did a brain scan of these people after 28 days, and they saw increased brain activity in areas of the brain associated with emotion and cognitive function. So now we're seeing that probiotics are actually starting to work in humans. Uh, a similar study was looking at self-reported feelings uh, after probiotic consumption, and they found that there was reduced self-reported feelings of sadness, reduced self-reported feelings of aggressive behaviors, kind of similar to uh, some other things we've talked about. And these studies are ongoing right now. This is a, a 2013 paper, and you know, these studies are, are, are brand new. And that's one of the things I think is really important to talk about with, with this field, is that this field is in its infancy. Even though you saw that really fast increase in the number of papers that have been published, this field is still really far in its infancy. And in humans, we can't really look at the mechanisms of how these are working, but we can look at the mechanisms in animals and really start to understand how the gut microbiota is actually influencing brain health and brain behaviors. So what we're starting to find is that the gut microbiota is actually capable of influencing behavior in a variety of fashions. Um, there's this direct communication via the vagus nerve. There's also the immunomodulation. As someone said, said earlier, 70 to 80% of your total immune cells are located in your gastrointestinal tract. 
that represents a huge potential for your gut bacteria to interact with your immune system and perform immunomodulation. So it's well known that certain probiotic bacteria as well as commensal bacteria can induce the development of anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory immune cells. Uh, they also have all sorts of coats on, the bacteria have coats on them that interact with the immune system and can cause production of different uh, cytokines as well as other inflammatory mediators. And then we also see that there's this idea of systemic communication between our gut bacteria and the central nervous system in our brain. And this is through production of neurotransmitters, production of bacterial metabolites, um, and some of the most important bacterial metabolites produced by our gut microbiota are these short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids were well known for helping support gut health, but once they do make their way into serum, they actually can reach the blood-brain barrier where they cause the blood-brain barrier to increase in junction strength, so it's actually decreasing the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. This helps keep out toxins and other potential harmful compounds. Um, not only that, but once these short-chain fatty acids make their way into the brain, they're actually able to alter levels of neurotransmitters directly in the brain. Uh, there was some really interesting research done by Jeff Gordon's lab, uh, and this was kind of a, a groundbreaking study where he took the microbiota out of a obese mouse and transferred it into a lean, germ-free mouse. That le lean, germ-free mouse had this huge increase in appetite because of neurotransmitters produced in the brain due to changes in its microbiota, and it became obese. This is just some of the ways that the gut microbiota is actually able to influence behavior. And we're starting to see that uh, the gut microbiota influences mood. It's been associated with changing social behaviors, anxiety-like effects, as we talked about earlier in germ-free mouse. Not only that, but the neurophysiology, it can stimulate the production of growth hormones in the brain that can help improve brain health or support brain health. And also it can influence sleep patterns. So, um, and there's, there's a study looking at lactobacillus brevis where they actually uh, administered lactobacillus brevis and they saw that the animals that were given lactobacillus brevis actually slept through the night better, well, slept through the day because mice are nocturnal. Um, but nonetheless, they were actually able to improve their sleep patterns. And the bacteria didn't even need to be alive. They did a heat-killed bacteria and they were still able to see this positive effect, thinking that it's either related to the coating of that bacteria and how it's interacting with the immune system or because it's causing, it's simple administration of that bacteria is causing changes in the genome of the entire gut microbiota that's then reflected in a better sleep pattern. And I should note that those bacteria, uh, the administration of that bacteria also increased voluntary wheel running. So maybe we just need to eat more dead bacteria and we'll get rid of that obesity problem we have. Now, I talked about the production of neurotransmitters. The gut microbiota is starting to be accepted as a major source of production of neurotransmitters, and not only as a major source of production of neurotransmitters, but it also can manipulate and stimulate the production of neurotransmitters in the gut. A large amount of the body's serotonin and dopamine is actually produced within our enteric system. Um, not only that, but some of these rarer neurotransmitters, such as tryptamine, this is a, a neurotransmitter that's not really considered uh, very much when you're talking about brain health, but tryptamine is, is very commonly used as a drug in, in uh, like psychiatric or, um, hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, so, you know, the production of these neurotransmitters cannot be underappreciated. And again, we don't really fully understand what these neurotransmitters are doing when they're being produced by the gut microbiota. Um, the serotonin and its precursor 5-HT that are produced in the gut probably aren't making their way into the brain and crossing the blood-brain barrier and actually influencing central nervous system function there. But they can be interacting through the vagus nerve and influencing function that way. And the gut microbiota is producing tryptophan, which is a precursor to uh, serotonin, and that can cross into the blood-brain barrier and serve as more building blocks for serotonin. Now, someone also mentioned earlier that there is a very, very common association between, alter or between uh, uh, mental illness, psychiatric, neurological illness, and digestive problems. Well, unsurprisingly, alterations to the gut microbiota are also very common in neurological illness and psychiatric illness. Uh, normally, you have uh, the small intestine being predominantly colonized by lactobacillus, while the large intestine is predominantly colonized by bifidobacterium and clostridium. Uh, and changes to this makeup can have a large influence on the genes that are being expressed by this microbiota genome, as well as uh, the, the things that are being produced by this microbiota. Uh, there was a study looking at uh, where they induced autism in mice by uh, causing immune reaction in the mother before she gave birth. And they were able to show that there was a 
metabolite produced by these bacteria for ethylphenyl sulfate that if they were was increased in the autistic uh, mice and if they were able to take either the bacteria that produced it or administer it to healthy mice, they could induce autism-like symptoms in healthy mice. Speaking of, of autism, this is a very common disorder where we see changes to the gut microbiota. Um, there is a decrease in the number of bifidobacteria in autistic children. This is pretty common, as well as an increase in the number of lactobacillus. Uh, and although this is kind of a, a uh, maybe confusing pie graph for those of you who aren't familiar with the different families of bacteria, all it's really meant to represent is that small changes in the overall makeup of the gut bacteria can have significant in, uh, impacts on our overall health. And I want to stress that this is all very correlative. These aren't causative studies, really. This is looking at correlation, changes to the gut microbiota, and also changes to uh, overall different health outcomes. And autistic children often display uh, dietary aversions. There's uh, foods that they won't, will or won't eat. And the authors actually took this into account when they were doing this study to see if uh, different changes in the gut bacteria was just simply associated to dietary aversions. And after controlling for all these variables, they still saw these changes in the gut microbiota, indicating that there's something else going on other than just dietary aversions. And so, you know, I'd just like to conclude by reminding everyone of the 2,000-year-old uh, Hippocratic statement, all diseases begin in the gut. And I think this is maybe more true than ever as we're starting to understand what the role of the gut microbiota is. And right now, we are all present. We are all taking part in the microbiome revolution. This is a very fast-growing field, and we don't really understand what our increased exposure to antibiotics, our increased exposure to pesticides, uh, our increasingly hygienic world is doing to us and is doing to our gut microbiota. There are a lot of researchers that are linking this overall overly hygienic lifestyle to changes in health outcomes. Uh, cesarean section, when babies are born and born via cesarean section, they're inoculated with a much different type of bacteria, a skin bacteria, instead of a vaginal and fecal bacteria. This cause, and cesarean section is largely associated with increased risk of allergy, asthma, and other diseases, but also increased inflammation, and everyone knows that inflammation plays a major role in the development of a lot of different neurological diseases as well. Um, so I just want to remind everyone before lunch that you're not going to eat alone. Um, take into account, you know, I actually have to think about this now every time I eat anything. I'm like, huh, I wonder what my gut bacteria think of this. Uh, and it's really, it's an amazing field, and I think you should be excited to stay tuned and, and watch what's going to be happening in this field. Uh, and so thank you, and I think we'll save any questions for when we have our, our moderator panel.